Hello, and welcome to the Real Health Conversations podcast. I'm your guest, Holly Jean. I'm here with my co-host, Leah. Hi, Leah. Hi, Holly. Hi, everyone. And our guest today is Rachel Summers. She is the owner. She's a farmer at Resilient Growers, which is a regenerative agriculture farm here in Tulsa. Welcome, Rachel. Hi. Hey, guys. Okay, so we have been looking forward to having you on because on the show recently, we've been talking all about the importance of um, nutrients in our food and what an important role um, how our food is grown actually plays in the role of the nutrients in our food. So we are really looking forward to this conversation, but first we want to hear a little bit more about you. So you have a master's in environmental management, a bachelor's in zoology. Have you always been a farmer or why don't you tell us a little bit about your story? Okay. Uh, If you would have asked me 15 years ago, if I was, if I saw myself as a farmer when I was 30, I definitely would not have seen that. Um, My whole, my main goal in life is just to do something really big environmental. And um, when I got into zoology, I thought I was going to do that with animals uh, at the zoo. And then I thought, well, I can do something even bigger with industrial environmental management. And um, in my master's, we actually, we didn't focus on agriculture at all, really. Um, I think the the closest thing to it was, there was a report we read on um, fart bags on cows and how that could be a solution to it, which is an absolute ban. But uh, that's as far as we ever got into it. And so, Um, as you know, I'm working in industry and I start to see, I start to read more on agriculture. Uh, I see this book in a bookstore called Kiss the Ground by Josh Tickell. Um, That's what changed it all for me. Um, He put exactly how big of an impact agriculture can play in being a solution to so many things, Um, our health, the environment, um, getting the carbon cycle back in balance, just a ripple effect of benefits. And I just, I got hooked on that and I kind of went full steam ahead um, into regenerative agriculture from there. Very cool. Yeah, I think uh, I think we miss so much of the story when it comes to we just hear what's going on with carbon or going on with the environment and we hear little bits and pieces about um, agriculture, but I don't think we ever really hear the whole story and how it's all really interrelated and it's a bigger, it's a bigger picture than just Um, or actually it's a bigger puzzle than just little tiny pieces and we need to put it all together. So tell us about your, your farm, like what kind of stuff do you guys have going on over there? Okay. So uh, my farm is a 10 acre uh, regenerative farm with livestock and vegetable production and eggs. Um, What we try to do is imitate nature um, going back to how did, how did the bison um, roam the prairies or roam across the the Midwest? Um, How did predators act in that um, as far as the livestock side goes? And then the vegetable side, how do I use my entire acreage to benefit the vegetable production. So everything is an integrated system on my farm. Every acre plays a role in the other, you know, nine acres um, on the farm. And so by doing that, we have so many living aspects. We have sheep, goats, chickens, pigs, uh, vegetable production. Um, We have compost production, we have a creek that we maintain, and then also woods that we maintain by using our livestock and everything, um, the pigs and the sheep, they play a role in, in in the fertilization of my vegetables too. Everybody has a role in everything. That's kind of the, the main, the main aspect, keeping diversity in everything that we do. Yeah, everything has to have a purpose. So did you just kind of start small and grow into 10 acres? Like, how did you learn exactly how everything works together? A lot of trial and error, like, like what is, okay, I'll just rephrase like where this question is coming from. So I relocated to Oklahoma, you're from California. Um, I've 
I work in real estate now. I work with so many families who are also coming out here and buying land and they want to get into this farming and regenerative agriculture. And they're finding, oh gosh, this is really hard. Like, how do you actually <laughs> learn it? Like, how did you learn this? So it, it is a lot of books. I have a massive bookshelf of just, there are so many brilliant farmers out there who have done this and, and succeeded. I have no doubt that I won't be successful at this just because of how many people are doing it right now. It's this revolution that has kind of been hidden in books and is starting to come out in Instagram. Like there is so much on Instagram. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Um, and so that's been, uh, that was the, the base of, of where I learned everything. And a lot of it, yes, is just trial and error there over the past year. Um, I, I just, I've experienced so much life and so much death and I just so much has, I have learned from the past year. That's the only way you just have to immerse yourself into it and um, do the best that you can with what you have available because you cannot predict the weather or what, what is going to happen. You can't predict what predators you're going to deal with or so many other factors that you have no control over. You're a shepherd on your land and that's it. You can, you can guide your farm and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of interesting how you say like you have all these books and you've had to learn it. And I've experienced people trying to learn this, but this wasn't always something that had to be learned. This, this used to be the way farming was. This was how we did things, but we've just gotten so far removed from that system or, or like this symbiotic relationship on a farm with our land and our food. And it's like, now we just have to come back to all that. And it's like this lost art that people are trying to rediscover. Right. Yeah. It, it, you do. It is so scary because you feel so many more emotions um, with life on the farm every day because you're so immersed in it <laughs> in that symbiotic relationship there's so many things that you didn't you, that I didn't even realize um I would feel uh being a part of it I guess being so disconnected yeah well it's I disconnected is the exact the exact word to describe it because we have become just so disconnected from our food sources whether that is from the strawberries we eat or to the hamburgers we eat it doesn't matter if it's animal products or plant products where we've grown up just your food comes from the grocery store so to actually see where it comes from and be involved and get your hands in in the dirt and um i can imagine just how incredibly powerful that is so um, I want to kind of switch gears a little bit. What are some things that you've seen um, like beneficially from you guys running the farm? Because I know you're here at the local farmers markets. Um, how are you seeing it impact the community, like bringing your fresh stuff to the community? Um, do you have like some community partners that you work with? Like what are some benefits you're seeing there? Yeah, uh, so we started in fall of 2020. Um, and I was producing, I was getting, I was getting to that point where I can harvest vegetables, but I was having a really hard time selling them. I was terrified. I was like, where am I going to make money? Cause I, I had done all that work and not very much time went to marketing. I just didn't have time for it. Um, once I figured out that the Tulsa farmer's market was the place to be, that that's where the highest demand was. It's where everyone goes that truly believes and understands um, what, what it takes to farm. These, our customers, it's like, we call it this magical place because our customers completely get it. Like they show up in hail and, and thunderstorms and, <laughs> and the, the dead of winter, like they're, they're there every single Saturday. It's amazing. So that is, is what really keeps us going on top of, we have all of these really cool restaurants popping up like farm bar and living kitchen who sort, who, who source their vegetables and they also pay the, the right price for it. They don't pay that super low wholesale price that we can't survive on. They're willing to pay for it and, and then promote it too. They do a great job promoting it. And then, and then <laughs> we have so much support. I cannot produce enough. There's so much demand right now. We have programs like Fresh RX that are popping up that want to buy directly from us as well. And so right now the regenerative farmers in Tulsa are basically dealing with um, we, we have 
the market available. It's just, can we grow it? That's it. That's amazing. I love that there's the awareness is out there. There's a demand for it and that there's um, places like yours where people can like meet that supply and you guys come together and it really is like a community. So Leah and I have been talking a lot about um, nutrition, of course, because that's what we do and um, nutrients in our food and how we grow our food determines the quality of the food that we eat, the nutrients that's in our food, whether it's full of chemicals or pesticides, herbicides, you know, glyphosate, all the things that people don't want to eat. So I want to kind of switch the conversation over into more about like how this, this whole cycle of regenerative agriculture works for the soil and like the importance of nurturing that that soil to one help the environment to like produce yield um and all that stuff leah do you have something you want to add before we pop into this article or uh no i think um I think we should just also say too that, you know, we're, we're coming from the angle of learning a little bit more about the soil and why that's so important because most of us kind of think about, oh, um, you know, we're starting with the, just the food, you know, like, you know, we're choosing foods that don't are growing in a, in a particular way. We don't think about, um, hang on, let's back that back right back up then to think about the farming process and then back that up again to even just like, the soil that things are being grown in. So I guess it would be really great to, um, yeah, to, to bring that into the discussion as well about like why the soil is actually so important here. Okay. So that is, it is a very um, detailed answer that can be summarized pretty well by, um, by how nature works. Nature uh, puts in a whole diversity of things in everything that it does. There is always competition in nature and there's always survival of the fittest. Um, what we do as farmers in regenerative agriculture is supply nature with what it needs to survive and, and what it needs to be successful and it will take care of the rest. It will, it will compete and it will do it will create survival of the fittest and then it will create a resilient um, and environment. So we focus on the texture of the soil, how much moisture is in it, how much air, uh, macronutrients and micronutrients and, and carbon is, is the biggest thing that is the, this, the building block of life. Um, when you have carbon um, and what my husband and I have really found out each year, we notice that just add carbon is kind of our answer. When anybody asks us, how, do, how can I grow good vegetables? Um, how can I build my soil? It's like, just, just add carbon. It, it's so much simpler than we ever thought it was um, that it, I don't know why it got so complicated. It's, it's just giving the soil what it needs and then it will take care of itself and it will then in turn give you nutrient dense crops and, and it'll feed your body and you will be resilient too. So it's just this, this domino effect. So what kinds of things, like how do you add carbon? Like that sounds simple, just add carbon, but what adds carbon to the soil? So you can add carbon in many ways and how we do it is through um, what would be considered waste in Tulsa. Uh, we, we source those areas. We source food scraps from food banks, um, coffee grounds from uh, the coffee shops, and then most importantly, uh, wood chips and leaves uh, from the city. And, and that's a free resource too, and it's never ending. Um, and then we also use cover crops and cover crops are huge. Uh, when you're not tilling um, and you're just, and you're giving your soil a break by cover cropping it, that the roots and the cover crops pull a lot of carbon for you. And if you do it correctly, like tarping it and, and leaving it there, um, you're adding a lot of carbon that way as well, in addition to other nutrients too. Interesting. So that when you're gathering like food scraps and leaves and stuff, is that for composting? Right. Composting, okay. mulching around your, your crops to uh, make, make them more efficient at water usage too. We do a lot of um, mulching in the walkways or mulching around uh, sensitive plants in the heat of the summer. It helps them retain moisture and, and have a little bit more resilience in the you know, hundred degree days that you know, we've been having. 
So what are some of the things that are depleting the carbon from the soil? So is it like things that us humans are doing or is it climate change or a mixture? There is uh, tillage is very common in conventional agriculture. And that is one way that you can quickly um, take carbon out of the soil and, and emit it as CO2. And um, through tillage, you're basically why we do it is we're trying to create that mechanical structure that we like in our soil. Um, it also in it adds a lot of oxygen to the soil, which gets the microorganisms in the soil going really quickly. The ones that are still there, um, tilling can, can disrupt mycorrhizal fungi and, and worms, um, but like the bacteria in the soil after tillage will quickly eat up that carbon and release it. So it's a short-term solution that grows good crops, but in the long-term it's, it's devastating. Yeah, so in this article we have, which is called We've Neglected Our Soils for Too Long, um, it says that since farmers began tilling in the US, 57.6 billion tonnes of topsoil have been eroded and globally more than 70% of our topsoil is gone. And it's estimated that if soil degradation continues at those rates, we'll have less than 60 harvests left before our global food system falters or collapses. So that to me doesn't sound like a very long time. Are we in, is it like, I know um, we read a lot of articles, they tend to kind of like sensationalize things. Is this being sensationalized or is this like serious? We've got a serious issue here and we all need to be out there doing something about it. Gosh, yeah, I would, I would think that we, we need to do something now. 60 years is, that's in our lifetime. <laughs> it's yeah. Like, and it's crops that are going to be less nutrient dense too. So we're going to need more of those to eat just to get what we're getting now. <laughs> um, so, and, and it's such an easy fix too, if we all just put all of, put our resources into it, it's, it's very easy. And it's, it's actually something we can do. It, it's achievable. I think that's what I love about it so much. Yeah. And I guess we'll talk about some of the ways that we can achieve that a little bit later. Holly's article kind of goes through some of that. But one thing I wanted to ask about, like still going back to the article, is that it's saying that um, it's, I guess it's getting so serious now that large companies like Nestle and Unilever and the Biden administration are starting to put money into it. Do you think that this is a good approach? Like we kind of, you know, have this fear about some of these companies are the cause of some of these issues anyway. But um, do you think that, uh, you know, getting these companies involved and, and getting the right funding and things like that are going to be helpful to this situation? Hopefully they're seeing it the way I'm seeing it, which is as an environmental manager, we looked at people, profit and planet. And one thing that regenerative agriculture did for me was it benefited all three of those things in so many ways. So if they're looking at it from an, and that's something I was always taught, you know, tell the company how it's going to affect them economically in a beneficial way. Um, and that's, that might be what they're seeing is if, if we increase the topsoil, we're gonna get a lot more bang for our buck by doing that. Um, so I think that it's gonna help them in the same way it's helping the rest of the planet too. Yeah, definitely. I think that, um, you know, the other solutions that other big companies are looking at, like just, you know, inventing fake meat isn't the way that it's gonna be <laughs> helpful for the environment or anything or us. Well, is there, I think there's kind of a little bit of a conflict of interest there because in one sense, I feel like there's such this big push still towards all the monocrops that are going into all these plant-based foods and stuff, but those are also the crops that are responsible for a lot of the soil like um, degeneration. And so I don't know how these companies that are pushing this plant-based movement for these monocrops and then saying, oh, well, we want to also do regenerative agriculture. Like, I don't know how those two things go together. I would like to have hope that, that they can figure it out, but it, it kind of seems like two different end goals there. And so I hope they just pick the right team. Right. And that's what I loved about that article was talking about how we really need a good way to track it and, and record the data and really like like carbon credits um, push that a little more in the agricultural sector to where we we can pay farmers for those the carbon they're putting in the soil so we can ensure that that's actually happening and it's not just you know part of the sustainability plan like everything else is yeah <laughs> 
Well, Holly and I really like to be like share things that are proactive that we, you know, can inspire people and empower them. Like we just don't want to sit here and say the soil is degrading and, you know, there's awesome people out there like you, but then none of us can contribute or help to it. So I'll hand over to Holly to talk more about that. Yeah, and I, I think this is something we talk about too, is just like taking taking food back into our own hands um, and and to not sit helpless as as a consumer, you know, no matter what that is, and and bringing back that connection to our food and whether that's growing herbs in a windowsill or starting a little backyard garden or something, but there always has to be something that we can do um, to be a little bit proactive. And so I like this article, even though it is um, um, this one's across the pond for about British farmers here, um, but it's talking about eight things we can do to improve soil health. And just depending on whether you have 10 acres or you have a 10th of an acre, these are just some things that maybe you could be doing in your, in your backyard garden. Um, but we do all, um, we all have something that we can do. So it talks about 10 things, or sorry, eight things you can do to improve your soil. Um, and one of them is to review the cultivation methods, which I think you touched on. That would be the, like the tilling, right? Right, yeah. I mean, you can see the results of that in about two months, I think. It's amazing how many bugs start to show back up when you stop tilling. And it's good bugs. I mean, you do have bad bugs, but just watch and 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 learn about how the the good bugs will come in pretty quick. It's really cool. <laughs> um, and then you said something about um, for tarping and doing cover crops too. So what what does the benefit of tarping do? Like I do just see some areas that are like covered where it looks like there used to be a garden and there's a tarp over it. And I kind of just thought that was like just trying to kill off a garden by blocking the sun, but how was that beneficial for the soil? And when would you do that? When tarps, when, when farmers start, first started tarping, it created this whole new game for us. It, it, it's really cool. So you, when you first start a farm and you're, you're breaking into like what used to be prairie or Bermuda grass or something that you cannot just plant vegetables into, um, tarping is a way to terminate what was there before and then start growing maybe with or without that initial tillage. It's hard to do it without the initial tillage, but there is a way to do it if you, if you take the time to do it. So that is another way using tarps to terminate co uh, cover crops. So that allows us to utilize cover crops in between successions of plantings. It kind of gives us a lot more options um, to keep the soil covered all the time. So it, it also acts as kind of like a protective barrier too. If you do have the soil exposed, you can tarp it and it's not releasing carbon dioxide or um, creating that hard pan when it rains. You're kind of protecting it until you do plant in it. So it gives okay. us a lot of yeah. You can heat and cool the soil with tarps. It's endless. It's, it's, a, it's awesome. <laughs> okay, so that would be under one of these things here where it says preserving organic matter. So that kind of falls in that category, right? Um, and then, of course, it talks about what we've already mentioned, like optimizing crop rotation. So growing like a diversity of crops um, aimed for better nutrient balance. So not always growing the same thing. This was kind of interesting is agroforestry. It says introduce more trees into a productive crop or a livestock systems that could help degrade the soil. So how do trees play a role in this? So trees, trees on my farm are huge. Um, we've got about 40% tree cover on our 10 acres. And so in, in times like this, when it's hundred degrees and your, your cattle or your livestock are not, they're not eating right now. If they're in the direct sun, there's no, like, we don't want to eat either. Like we're just not hungry. Um, they're the same way. So how do you increase your effectiveness or, or the efficiency of your cattle eating? You want them to eat so you can get them to wait. Um, and so that's how we can introduce trees into the system by giving them more shade over more surface area so they can spread out and continue eating grass under there. And there's another term for that, silvopasture. Um, but there's a book on silvopasture by Stephen Gabriel that's really good, but he, he is able to incorporate um, trees into his grazing system to where like the sheep can get eat from the trees and get certain kinds of tannins that help prevent parasites. So a more natural system. 
uh, there's just so many ways you can utilize trees in your in your livestock system. It's unbelievable. And, and on top of that, just the certain types of trees too. We have planted 250 trees on our property on a 13% slope. So pretty good slope where there could be a lot of erosion. We planted them in a swale formation so that um, the trees are planted in like a, a, a kind of like a, a gully. In a, is that kind of clear <laughs> um, to where it stops water and it allows the water to sit where the trees are and the trees absorb the water. So we have three rows of that and then we'll plant successions of that over time. That will prevent erosion on the hill and it'll also give our sheep uh, something to forage off of uh, in the future in about six years. But <laughs> it's a long game with trees. Wow. I love that. That is amazing. I feel like um, we need more of that in Australia. I know we have a lot, we have, you know, a small group of regen farmers around Australia, but we have a lot of land that is just being either the trees are being removed or, you know, and just wide open spaces that the cattle are on. And I guess they're having to supplement feed them a lot of the time if they're not able to um, get the food, especially in the dry long summers. So yeah, yeah, what a great solution, trees. <laughs> yeah, it's because it, you always see the cattle under that one tree. They're all like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's great. Um, so what would be some of your tips for just like the everyday average Joe for helping to support their local regenerative farmers, helping to share information or just helping to all work together to save the future of farming and put the nutrients back in our food. It's kind of, it's funny how I've learned, I've talked to older farmers um, about how they used to just all sit at the gas station or like the coffee shop and talk about stuff. Or actually in our CS, I was talking to about this. And then there was a point where everybody stopped doing that. And then information stopped spreading and NRCS is trying to find new ways to communicate with farmers at what kind of grants they have because it's endless how much funding they have. Um, and that is that's just it it's like developing co ops and meetings where all the farmers meet together and talk about how we can share materials or equipment or just resources and and then communicating that to the government and there's. Aaron Martin actually from Fresh RX got this going. We've been meeting once a month and NRCS has been coming to these meetings and we've just been talking about problems we've been dealing with and they listen and talk and they communicate that to, to everyone at NRCS. So it's been really awesome just to be listened to and, and it's because regenerative agriculture is kind of different to what this to the system that they're used to with conventional agriculture, there are some changes that are going to be made. So it's it's going to take a little time, but I think it's definitely helping to sit down and talk. Yeah, definitely. Do you ever do like farm tours or education and stuff on your property? I do. Yeah. Um, it's I'm thinking back the last tour we did, it was like 98 degrees. I felt so bad for everybody. <laughs> um, but we do, we'll, we'll just, um, we'll walk them through the, the process and it's really cool to, to see it's a lot of gardeners we usually get. So it's cool to see how they're like, Oh, so I can just do that to get rid of squash bugs, different, different things. So we're always open. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to have to come visit because the squash bugs got me. <laughs> um, this is so great. Well, I think like the, the biggest thing we can do is just encourage people to seek out farmers such as yourself and do go to your local farmers markets and just have those conversations, ask the questions, ask how to get involved um, and show up to whatever local meetings are going on in your community. And if if these conversations aren't being had or these meetings aren't being had where you are, um, try to seek it out, connect with the farmers and maybe getting it going in your own areas. Do you have any other advice aside from that that might help people or around the globe? Because we have kind of an international audience here. Sure, yeah. Uh, I think you might've mentioned, go to your farmer's market, uh, source, source the food local, because that's going to be um, the game changer for the farmers. It's really going to help us by giving us the funding we need to keep going. Yeah. And actually talking to the farmers that you're buying the food from, because I know 
in LA where I moved from there, I knew lots of people who would just go to the store and buy food and then go and sell it at the farmer's market. So try to talk to the farmer, make sure they're actual real farmers. We don't yeah. want to be supporting scam artists here. Usually you can tell just by, um, you know, how much sun they've gotten or. You know. <laughs> That's true. It's like, well, let me see your farmer tan. Prove it. Prove it, buddy. <laughs> Dirt under their nails, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, this has been a really awesome conversation. I'm so glad we've been able to connect. Leah, do you have anything you want to add or? Say no, I think it's just. Off? I think it's great. I love hearing stories like this from real people working out in the, you know, in the, in the actual place, in the actual farm and, and doing really great things. And I think that, you know, we can't thank you enough for the job that you're doing. And if we can help promote and get the word out there, um, then hopefully that can be a help for you as well. It's, it's an immense amount of help. Yeah. Thank you. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you again so much. That is the end of today's episode. Our theme music is created by Andrew Bowden and oh, you know what? Sorry. I'm going to have Kevin edit this out. I want to plug you on social before we even hang up. So okay. sorry, we're giving, we're giving Kevin some work here. Um, okay. So you guys are resilient growers on Instagram, correct? Yep. At, at resilient growers farm and resilient then growers farm. Okay. We also have a website, um, resilientgrowers.com. Uh, we're not on it too much. <laughs> it's a little bit about us. Uh, but yeah, we, we sell at the, the farmer's market and then we do CSAs and then also um, to a few local stores and restaurants. Okay. All right. We'll be sure to link all that up in the show notes. Um, and yes, any of our local Tulsa area listeners, be sure you check them out at the Tulsa farmer's market. That's every Saturday, right? Yep. Every Saturday, even we'll be there until January. So it goes nice. for here yeah all right fantastic well thank you so much it's been wonderful having you on rachel and that is the end of today's episode our theme music is created by andrew bowden and production services are by kevin kennedy spain of disc of light media have a great week everyone have a great week